Imagine walking into the tabernacle courtyard through the colorful gate. Standing before you, about four and a half feet high and seven and a half feet square, was the great altar in constant use. Quote, a fire shall always be burning on the altar, Leviticus 6.13. It's the first and largest piece of furniture seen when entering the sacred court. Its position made it unavoidable. Its purpose was unmistakable, and without participation, access to God was unavailable. Quote, you shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. Exodus 27, 1 and 2. Although the word bronze is used here, the Hebrew word nekosheth can mean copper or bronze, a copper alloy, a fire-resistant material that sheathed the almost indestructible acacia wood. With this metal covering, it could take the heat, just like our Lord Jesus, who consumed God's wrath without himself being consumed. Over this altar, we could well write the words, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9.22. Do you see the priests busily offering up the lives of lambs, goats, bulls, heifers, and doves? Can you imagine the sounds, sights, and smells? It's impossible to calculate the number of animals offered there. To many, it would seem a waste, but the Lord was teaching his people crucial lessons, vital for us too. First was the costliness of sin. A person could not simply trade good deeds for bad or pay someone off for sins. Quote, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. It must be, quote, life for life, Exodus 21, 23. It's good that we pause at the cross to carefully consider how awful sin must be, and then rejoice in the remarkable shift that occurred when, quote, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, John 10, 11. It was common that sheep should die to sustain their shepherds, but who would ever imagine that the shepherd would die for the sheep, especially when that shepherd is the creator. The sheep are his creatures and his enemies at that. Second, these animals were to point to a perfect substitute. Each sacrifice must meet God's approval. Quote, whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. Leviticus 22, 20. Thus the importance of the united testimonies of all regarding God's lamb. Friends and foes, God, men, and demons, all agreed there was no fault in him. Third, the endless repetition told the people that they must look for an infinitely better sacrifice. For, quote, every priest stands offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. Hebrews 10 verses 11 and 12. The very act of repeating the sacrifices, like many church ceremonies today, should warn the observers that, quote, where there is remission of these transgressions, there is no longer an offering for sin. Verse 18. Trust in Christ's finished work alone brings perfect peace with God. The altar was, quote, hollow with boards, Exodus 27, 8, probably filled with earth and unhewn rocks. See chapter 20, verse 24. 
a grate or ledge ran around halfway up to facilitate the priest's constant labor. But our great high priest finished that work. Quote, by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10, verse 14. God's Calvary, like this altar, is a promontory of grace jutting out into the sea of man's greatest need. A horn on each corner where blood was applied speaks of his universal power to save. Yes, there's power in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> 